Hello and welcome to Data by the Slice. This is a podcast and video series covering a broad range of topics related to data. We will speak with interesting people who know a thing or two about data and who live and breed data on a daily basis. Our guests are professionals with whom we'll talk about what it's like to design, implement and operate data-related frameworks, tools and approaches in the real world. We'll talk about data management, software development, service design, public clouds and many other things, including trendy topics like data mess. Our goal is to hear how these work in a real life. Our intent is also to get to know our guests, where they come from, what they've learned along the way and where they see themselves and the world going. I am your co-host, Lasse. And I'm your co-host, Antti. Take a comfortable position, get a drink, and have a slice of data with us. Okay, this is episode one of season one. And honestly, we don't know at this point if there will be a season two or even how long season one will last. But we'll see. We'll listen to feedback. We'll learn and adjust as we go. We'll publish these conversations both as audio podcasts and as a video on YouTube. Our guest today is Stephen Perry, Director of Data and Analytics at Genius Sports. Uh, Steve, someone I was introduced to a few years back. Uh, it was in the context of data catalogs, and it was almost like a sort of like a blind date setup for a consultant. The hope was that uh, we'd find some common ground and business opportunities, maybe work together. It didn't lead to any direct collaboration or a consulting engagement, but Steve and I had a really good discussion. And we just simply agreed to continue having these conversations. Uh, we both found value in, in the thought exchange. And uh, first we were talking about data catalogs and then it brought into all kinds of topics related to data and digitalization. Until at some point you were then brought into the, the conversation, we started talking about data mesh, it was a new thing. And we still continued having these insightful chats and conversations without any, any other motivations. Uh, this then sparked the idea of, of doing this interview series. Uh, it was actually Steve who suggested that we should do this uh, in public. We should just do something that is public, like these conversations. So here we are today, recording our first of hopefully many good discussions with interesting people. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let's go to our conversation with Steve Perry. Uh, Steve joins us from his home in London, the UK. All right, so welcome, Steve, to the first episode of Data by the Slice. Great to have you on board, um, and it's good to see you again. Great, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, asking me to, to be here. It's great to, great to be talking to you guys again. Yes, so we're going to start this one off the way we're going to start off every episode going forward. So the question is simply, how did you get into data? Um, so like a, a lot of people, I started at the bottom. Uh, my first role was in support, um, which I was pretty good at, but I didn't really enjoy because every time someone phones you, they're already angry because something's broken. Um, and wanting to uh, make a departure from the support team, I was given two choices. I could look at uh, the database side of things or, or move more into the front end application development. Uh, I started looking at SQL Server, um, found that I not only was able to pick it up relatively easily, but I actually really enjoyed it and enjoyed that way of thinking and I haven't looked back since. Awesome. What's the coolest data, data related initiative you worked on? Yeah, so uh, cool is a fairly relative term when it comes to data. Uh, it's it's <laughs> difficult, difficult to get much street cred with it. Um, but I mean, I, I think that I've, I've been very lucky to be involved in a lot of different types of projects and a lot of uh, in a lot of different companies, you know, from fintech companies uh, all the way through to large entities like Cisco. Um, but I, I think probably the the thing that stands out the most in my mind was um, the first application that was deployed where I'd written the data structure entirely myself in the back end. And it wasn't a huge application. There were only about 3,000 users. And it only actually ended up existing for about three years. Uh, but knowing that every time, uh, every time someone clicked on something, an update was made, uh, a report was created, it was coming from uh, my data structure that I'd created all by myself. That was that was a great great experience fairly early on in my career. Yeah, it's all about impact, and also we don't. I don't think we need to worry in this circle about you know whether data stuff is geeky or cool. I think we all <laughs> consider it to be cool. So so yeah. Um, 
we'll be talking a lot about distributed data systems and architectures and especially this hype term around data mesh. Uh, so just for everyone to, to know the context of where we are approaching this from, we also want to ask you, um, if you have to pick a camp, do you come from the camp of like the monolithic data management um, camp or from the software development microservice based uh, camp? So I have been working with data for over 15 years now, which means that I have to have come from the camp of monolithic data architecture, because up until the last sort of, you know, five, 10 years, that's all there was. Um, uh, these days, I think probably a smarter way of doing it is, uh, is orientated around microservices and dividing up data you need and, and sort of focusing it on its application. Um, that at the moment breaks down a little bit when you come into uh, the realm of analytical data as opposed to operational data. Uh, and that's where data mesh fits in, I guess. That's cool. It's, it's really interesting. Um, you're saying that it's kind of, it was the only way to go with the monolith. What, what do you think is the, the reason why um, we only now in the world of data moving into looking sort of other options outside the monolith? So we've, we've changed how we think about data. Um, so 15, 15 years ago, when I, uh, when I started working with data, um, it was a byproduct of an application or a service or a function of a company. And people were starting to, uh, to treat it as value in and of itself, but that is still in fairly, it's fairly in pretty much in the early stages of that. Um, these days, lots of companies orientate their value at least in part around the data that they hold so that mindset has changed and you know the um uh the analogy of data being the new oil is is correct so you know as as we've applied more value to it as a as a commodity we've had to come up with new ways of managing with uh, managing it work working with it uh distributing it understanding it uh, and that's led to our change in thinking. So, you know, if things if things had remained the same, if if data wasn't the ubiquitous entity that it is today, we would still be all working off a single um, uh, OLAP warehouse somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I have to confess, I also come from the the same monolithic camp with you know the single data warehouse and the BI platform on top. But you know, that's that's where that's. We all have our histories. Um, this concept of data mesh is is currently it's a it's a big and hot topic. Um, where did you come across it the first time, and what was your reaction to it? Um, so we've been working on a strategy in Genius Sports about how we uh, how we manage our data and how we get the most value out of it um, possible. Um, and along as part of that we've been trying to tackle some problems that um uh, that exist you know and, and they're, they're common problems so how do you uh how do you understand the data that you have in an organization how do you ensure that you can easily access and use it um when you need it and how do you bring that sort of time to insight down so you know so, someone wants to answer a question with data how do you enable them to do that themselves in hours rather than you know in weeks or months and requiring a lot of development effort so we've been thinking about these sorts of problems for uh, for a little while now, um, and uh, it was only about two or three months ago when I read the ThoughtWorks article on data mesh, um, and my first reaction to that was, like, "Oh, cool! It's, it's, it's got a name," um, and it was uh, it was pretty it was spookily aligned to some of the things that we'd been uh, that we've been working on and some of the, the concepts and problems that we've been uh, that we've been turning over. Um, and I think I think it is I think it is a really good uh, really good write up, and I think it is a really good a really good starting point to 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 start sort of talking about data in a in a in a different way, or at least thinking about it in a in a slightly different um, uh, different process, and, and and applying different sort of values and attributes to it. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear because that's. That's what we run into quite often when when we talk to different different companies. It's it's quite a quite a many have been saying that yeah we have been looking into something like this, but well now we got a name now we can sort of um, talk around the topic and and that's really interesting. Uh, if if we go into like um, you first read it and and you thought about it, did you have some disagreements with the with the concept? Yeah, I my my main my main disagreement was that. 
I, I think it oversimplified certain elements. So within Data Mesh, um, the, the idea, to me anyway, the idea of ownership is key. And it's got some, it's got some really good and positive things to, uh, to say about, uh, about sort of who should own data and, and the responsibilities around, around those owning teams, which I, which I think is, is great conceptually and exactly the, the direction that, um, uh, that we in general uh, as sort of data professionals should be moving in. Um, but I do think it, it, it oversimplifies, turned a couple pages at once and sort of, you know, sometimes presents it as a, presents itself as a solution uh, to, to sort of problems that aren't necessarily just data problems. Some of them are organizational problems and structure problems and, and understanding problems. Um, and, you know, of course, if you could click, click your fingers and make sort of product teams own analytical data and understand, understand sort of the, the responsibilities that go with that and the value that they're, that they're delivering, have their skill sets uh, to, to enable them to do that properly, then yeah, it would be great. But it's, it's quite a big gap going from sort of that starting point today to, uh, to that. Is there, there's a couple of dimension, I think, dimensions, I think, to that. One is just the concept itself and on which level we're talking about it. Is it just like a principle and how specific does it get within the rules? And then the other thing, I just wanted to pick out what you mentioned about the name. To me, the reason I sort of like that philosophy is, is first of all, it is to me more of a philosophy and a principle. And the second thing is, I'm, I don't fully agree with the name. I think the name has like, there's a lot of um, people associated with, with certain things. But to me, the whole principle around organizing things more organically that sort of resonates so if i was to rename it i would probably call it something like organic data management or or something that doesn't even have the you know any legacy connotations with the words but w w what do you think how would you describe it in if you had to describe it with different words in one or two sentences I, I wouldn't have a go renaming it because uh, you know data mesh has a certain zing to it, uh, certainly more than uh, organic data management. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not a marketeer, so. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, I guess I, I guess if I were to try and describe it um, I, I, really really quickly, um, I would say it is a, a methodology of trying to apply some of the principles in microservice architecture to analytical data. Um, and, and I think, I, you know, I agree with you. It's, it works really well as a principle, as a, as a sort of set of focus and a, and a set of um, almost high level, high level objectives or, or direction of travel. Um, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not the same as, a, a, as microservices in the sense, you know, you can read, read a book or, or read some blog posts and, and get a template of how you, how you implement it. I, I think that the complexities in data mesh are greater than uh, than the, the complexities of taking a monolithic system and breaking it down into microservices. Yeah, I remember um, some time ago when we, we talked uh, around this topic, you said that, I can't remember what you said, but you, you had like a one eye opener that, yeah, this this clicks, this makes sense. Um, can't remember mm. what it was. Can you <laughs> can you remind me of it? You, you're not giving me a lot to work with. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, 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 we've spoken a lot in the past. Um, I, I mean, I think for, for me, for me, the, the, the eye opener was, was ownership, right? Um, and, 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 and it clicks because if you think about how we work now from an analytical perspective, so you, know, you, you data exists in organizations either through sort of like functional data stores, product data stores, but they're, they're, they're all sort of like operationally focused. So you will have data coming into to an organization for operational reasons. And we can we can treat that as like a big bucket of operational data. Um, there is the need in every business to do reporting, to do analytics. For more mature businesses, there's the desire to do sort of um, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all, all with a view of getting a better insight into how the business is operating. And for that, you need you need large amounts of data, um, and and the the sort of the considerations around the quality of data and the availability of that. But the the type of data and the, the sort of the measures and dimensions that you're that you're looking at and, and you need are going to be different from how it's structured in operational data stores. 
So that's where we come to the divide between sort of you know, operational and analytical, and we can we can roughly put things into those two high level buckets. So if you think about how that works today, um, you'll have a uh, an operational data store which is owned by a team, maybe it's a product team or internal team, and you know, whatever else. Um, and then to build analytics on top of that, the traditional model is that you take data from that operational data store and you put it somewhere else not only in a, a, a different sort of technology, like a data warehouse or a data lake or whatever, but also under the ownership of a different team. So maybe you've got a, you know, a BI team or a data science team or a data engineering team, and they take that, in, they take that data and they, you know, they, they munge it around, they create their measures and dimensions, and then it gets uh, used for whatever purpose it has downstream. But that doesn't really make sense because the team that owns the operational data store by definition, should be the subject matter experts of the data itself. So by taking the data away from that team, you're forcing yourself to either learn and become subject matter experts in that data that you, you weren't already, or to sort of you know, create this process where you have this back and forth saying, you know, I, I'm effectively going to put this data into a different format, but I need you to tell me what format it needs to be, what, what right looks like, what, uh, you know, wh whether this is correct. And that, the, the click for me was sort of, this fits much better in the same team. Why, why would you, why would you take, take the data away from a team that has the knowledge and the expertise and put it somewhere else just for the sake of reshaping it? Why wouldn't the team that has that expertise also be the team that does the reshaping and, and, and the ownership of the analytical data as well as the operational data. So for me, that was kind of the, the, the light bulb, like, you know, if we, can, if we can progress on the path towards this sort of model, then we'll be a lot uh, more agile as a business when it comes to using our data. And it's very similar to, I mean, Antti and I have had this <clears throat> debate too about um, when you take the data out of the application from where it originates from, then how relevant is that data once it's been pulled out of its own context? And it, it's similar, I guess, with the organizational aspect here too. Um, yeah, I think Antti and I, I don't know if we fully agreed on this one yet, but um, you know, can you use the data out of the application or not? It's, 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 it's a real hard one because it's like, um, it's like a spider's web as well, you know, try, trying to, Trying to trace the lineage of of data, especially in uh, you know in an organisation that is um, uh, fairly mature with microservices, trying to trace the true lineage of of data and going right from you know, this is this is a uh, this is a report that we are we're considering to be an endpoint of data, and we want to go back all the way through all the various different systems to see where where that data is is entered and, and where it's first created within the context of the organisation. It's hard. It's really, really hard because not only not only do you have to manage the um, the difference between um, uh, analytical and operational uh, data stores, but then you also have to think about the relationships between the different microservices. And then when you start to apply um, sort of data quality questions, you know, how can you make sure that you're looking at the sort of the source of truth for us uh, for a specific data point? If you are taking a uh, uh, if, if you're if, if you're building analytical data on top of data that has been replicated outside of the master, can you guarantee that that replica is correct at the point that you're building your analytical data? Uh, and the, the problems sort of explode exponentially um, from there. So it, you know it, it is it is tough. And then anything that you can do to move to move those problems closer to the team that that owns the original source data reduces the complexity hugely. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I agree. And we we have been talking with Lasse about this, and we call it skin in the game, to put the the domain team in in more having more responsibility, but also at the same time have more freedom to deal with the data that they work more closely with. Uh, but in an mm -hmm. essence, what happens is that the uh, we're distributing the data ownership, like you said, the ownership is is the key. I agree to that. Um, but do you see that you know? is the world ready for this kind of distributed systems? And is, is there like an organization that this approach fits in very nicely? Um, is the world ready? 
probably not. Certainly, my, most teams probably aren't. Uh, and I think you know one of one of my sort of one of the things that I uh, picked out as a problem from the ThoughtWorks Data Mesh article, first of all, or, or a challenge certainly, was how how would you go about convincing a product team or a development team that it's in their best interest to also own the analytical data? Uh, how how would you how would you present that to them in a way that they can not only sort of you know uh, understand and grasp but but engage with and and want to sort of want to take ownership of it um, and uh, and want to progress it? I I don't have any great answers to that uh, at at the moment. Um, I think I, I I think the the first point to that is to understand sort of you know the. The benefits of doing so and creating, putting that in terms of use cases that teams can understand. What we've been trying to do is we've been trying to orientate it around um, sort of disruptions to those teams. So you know, right right now, if someone has questions about a data about data that they own, be it sort of like from an operational or analytical perspective, the team that owns it will will get asked, and that question comes in the form of a disruption from their you know, product development. So. I'm trying to orientate the, the the value to them around the ability to work more freely and uh, and sort of effectively on the things that they want to work on, as opposed to answering people's questions about about data. And if they can not only have their their ownership defined correctly, but also uh, present the information that people need and, and and be able to allow people to self service answers to those questions, then they're going to get less disruptions. Um, and that. That's true for understanding, but it's also true for access. You know, if if someone, um, if if a uh, if a BI team or a, an analyst team of some type wants to uh, access data that isn't available, then the only option really right now is for a team to build uh, um, uh, a new API or a new method in an API to to expose that, which again comes at disruption to both the, the product development cycle and also what the team want to work on. Um, if there were a different way of doing it, if there were uh, different mechanisms of, of exposing this in different technologies, which perhaps reduced the, the complexity of exposing that data for analytical purposes, then the team spends less time building APIs, less time being disrupted and more time working on the stuff that they want to work on. That's, that's what I've been trying to do so far. It's had a moderate amount of success and a moderate amount of engagement. Um, in terms of what sort of companies this would benefit, um, I mean, ultimately, there isn't a single company that doesn't have data in in the world, and and, and the scale the scale changes. You know, larger larger companies by definition have to be have to be better at uh, at organising it. Um, but then you come into a different problem. So going back to that original question, you know, which which camp are you, monolithic or microservice? You can apply that to approaches to data management as well. You know, if, if you have if you have one approach to like let, let's say the whole company is uh, the whole company is abiding by the principles of data mesh, is that a monolith in itself? Will the implementation of that cause centralization, which which slows things down? I I, I don't know yet, but it's 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 something that has sort of been ticking around in my head. That is an interesting aspect. Um, you just talked there about you know how you frame this to the different teams and the benefits and so on. So one part of this whole data mesh philosophy is that you also have to have these connectors or interfaces between the different domains. And we're not just talking about technical things here. We're talking about people and teams and organizations. So what have you found? What works uh, when you try and connect the different teams and the domains? Not technically, but organizationally, what what works and what doesn't work? Yeah, so we have before we try to implement any uh, any sort of tooling or any any technolo technological solutions, we created a uh, a method of applying ownership to teams. Um, so we call them data stewards. Um, they could be data owners. They could be you know, responsible parties. Well, whatever. But effectively, it's a set of responsibilities that sits with an individual and they are not necessarily responsible for all of the data that sits within a team, but they are accountable for that, that team's management of, of data. 
So all of all of the teams that own data within Genius Sports have a data steward uh, or, or someone acting in the, the role of data steward. Um, and that is the, the, the method of us distributing that, that ownership and distributing those responsibilities out. Um, one of the things that works quite well is that when when there is a new policy to be distributed, a new data management policy, or you know uh, working on recoverability or um, anything else like that, um, we have the ability to push that out through the network of data stewards, uh, and then they they're able to take that back to their teams, and, and because they're part of the teams themselves, they're able to. Um, uh, fit it into their own workloads, fit it into to the organics of the team rather than it being sort of dictated, you know, this is something that you must that you must do and, and do it now. Um, and I think for us that that interface and the the, the, the interface of the data stewards is, is going to be key to everything that we build on top of this. Um, every bit of data that we have in our data catalogue, regardless of the level that you look at it, is associated with one of these data stewards. Um, so you can you can trace back every every bit of data to to a responsible or at least an accountable uh, an accountable person, um, and I think there's different layers on top of that as well as, as that matures. So you know the, the the data stewards I think will 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 have a great set of responsibility uh, within the teams, um, and then there will potentially be another set of responsibilities on top of that, perhaps uh, sort of a domain owner. Um, whose responsibilities will be slightly different, more focused potentially on you know, uh, value generation and, uh, and understanding the value of the data that fits in their domains and looking for ways of increasing that value by mixing it and merging it with other domains. Um, but I think that, that, that those sorts of structures are, form the, the core of the interfaces between the different parts of the business. Yeah, I think that's in line with I mean, what we see as well, and, and we work with mid-sized to large organizations, there is, um, I know I mentioned earlier, data mesh is, is to me is like organic data management, but there's a lot of formalities that organizations are working on right now in terms of defining <coughs> responsibilities related to data. And it's good because those didn't ex exist in, in the past. Um, so whether you, know, you call them data stewards or owners or something else, but most organizations right now are looking at, you know, the formalities around people's roles when it comes to data and information flows. I think that leads us to to you know another huge topic, um, the the beast we call data governance, which can mean lots of different things. Um, the I think the way we'll approach it in this case, when we talk about distributed systems and, and this philosophy between uh, of of data mesh where you distribute things and responsibilities, um, and then you have centralized data governance. But I think in your role, it's interesting to hear, how do you approach this when essentially data mesh is about um, distributing the ownership and the mandate, and you don't have the centralized control? So how do you deal with losing control, centralized control of things and, and letting people in the different teams own and do whatever they like? How do you deal with that? Um, personally, I don't have any sort of like internal conflicts with it. I, I, I see it as necessary to the ability to scale, um, putting central points of, of control into things will always be a barrier to, to scaling. Um, and I think the only, the only way that a, um, uh, an organization can scale their use of data is to distribute those controls out to the individual. Um, the other thing I try and do is I try and I try really hard to avoid ever saying data governance because people <laughs> hate that term. Me like, too. And, and I, I, I hate it too. Like, you know, as, as, soon, as soon as anyone hears it, you, you almost always switch off a, at least a little bit. Uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of bad history in it as well. You know, almost everyone will have worked in an organisation that has. Um, not necessarily bad rules around data governance, but rules that aren't understood by the individual well, or, or you know, the, the reasoning for them existing isn't isn't necessarily clear. And everyone will have suffered under the hands of having to having to do things from a governance perspective that you wouldn't ordinarily do, and not really understanding why. Um, I think that you know, that that's a key point to come back to as well. You know, focusing on the value that, that governance brings and. and getting a, a, a narrow focus on what you want, want what you want to actually get out of it 
Um, but um, trying to yeah, trying to avoid talking about things in terms of, of data governance and introducing sort of mechanisms and policies that kind of get the value of it in as a bit of a you know a Trojan horse. So you know ownership ownership is another way of saying governance, but you and you're giving people a bunch of responsibilities that they that they have to own, and those those responsibilities are the governance of the data. If you avoid saying governance, you talk about ownership. Ownership is a very positive thing. People like owning things. People like having responsibility and autonomy. And the the governance is really sort of kind of like the the, the guidelines to keep them to keep them going in the right direction and and to keep everyone sort of like aligned on the same path. Um, yeah, I, I I I think I I think to be successful as a distributed organization, your governance has to be distributed as well. If, if it's, so it's similar to what I was saying earlier, if, if you built a centralized governance system, then you probably haven't really built a distributed system at all because there's still a single point where everything must flow through. There's always a, there's always a bottleneck. Yeah. yeah. I, I like the approach of, yeah, the only way to scale is to distribute governance or ownership or mandate or whatever you want to call it. But the only way to scale is to distribute. I like that. Yeah, and it's of course um, some things you have to keep central in order to to uh, to give sort of a backbone of how you're working and so on. But I think it's a it's a balance between what are you centralized, what if you centralized, what's the benefit you get out of it, versus uh, decentralizing in order to scale. And I think the scaling is is really sort of key here. Uh, what we're talking about. Yeah, well, you know, a good example is um, is auditability, right? So, you know, audits are centralized processes. You, you will have an auditor who will uh, review uh, some aspect of a business from a, from a central perspective. If you have 50 different teams that have all taken 50 different approaches to auditing data or, you know, approaches to data privacy, um, personal data management, that's going to be a very hard exercise and it's going to be very difficult to get to the point where, where the auditor is able to say like, yeah, you guys, you guys are compliant or you're working in a correct way. So you need some form of centralization there, but the devil's in the detail. Um, and that centralization could be a, a centralized approach or a centralized sort of like data, data store of, uh, of the valuable information. So it can be accessed from an audit perspective centrally but then collected and distributed um, um, uh, by by the teams themselves. So you know, a, a really a really good example is with with GDPR. So most companies, I think, certainly in the UK, all companies of above a certain size have to have a data protection officer. Um, so which model is going to work better? The data protection officer going to each team once a week and saying, "What personal data do you have, and what are you doing with it?" or the teams creating processes to, to manage when they're interacting with personal data and report that centrally. Um, so the teams have the ownership and the autonomy to, to sort of define what they're doing, but the data protection officer still has the ability to report on it centrally for audit purposes. Um, so, it, and, and I think, yeah, you're, you're right. It's not, it's not always one or the other. It, 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 can, it, can, be, it can be both and finding, finding that line and finding that balance is the, is the key. All right, so we, we've talked to some extent here about governance and we've used terms like centralized and distributed. Um, I don't know if we used the word decentralized, but how do you see the language here, Stephen? Especially, you know, we're, we're looking to you, um, you're the, the native English speaker here. So uh, what terms would you use? What, what terms work here when we, t we try to describe this dynamic of doing things in teams and in domains versus having a central body doing things? So language is really hard. Um, and the, old, the older I get, the more frustrated I get with English. Um, it, it, it's, it's an amazing language that has a word for absolutely everything. Yet so many times the, the word can mean different things. The, you know, the, the contextual use of it is, uh, is, is difficult. And, and yeah, language is, language is a barrier, even in a country of pure native, native English speakers. And, and oftentimes you, you find that um, uh, the, the people who aren't necessarily native English speakers who have learned it as a second language uh, 
quite often offer a higher level of accuracy when it comes to uh, to the words they're using. And they're more considerate. Um, that's certainly my experience, anyway. Um, I, I think in terms of the, 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 the two words that you mentioned, distributed and um, and decentralized. So distributed for me suggests an implementation. You know, it's, it's almost like a, it's a design choice. Are you going to build something uh, build something centrally, or are you going to build multiple uh, multiple instances of it that that work together as a, a as a sort of a fabric? Whereas decentralized is more of a more of a statement of intent. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily imply to specific technologies or, or design choices. It's more like a, a statement of how you want to how you want to operate and how uh, and where you want sort of decisions to be made, where you want um, sort of autonomy to exist. Um, I, and it almost speaks more to to culture than it does to sort of like technologies and approaches. Um, but yeah, I, I think within any organization, language will always be the challenge. Um, we have, we have a lot of examples. So, you know, a really, a really good one is, uh, is events. So we are a sports data company, um, and lots of people, uh, describe the, uh, the things that we report on as sporting events, which is great and makes, makes total sense. But an event is also a, a term in technology. Uh, and we have a lot of events that move around our, our, our systems on a daily basis. And depending on who you're speaking to in the context that you're, that you're talking uh, within, the, uh, the term event changes. And these sorts of things happen every single day, every single hour. You know, there's all, like, it's, if you really think about it, there's probably, there's probably not a single day that goes by where you haven't sort of had to think about the words that you're using and is it is it appropriate for the specific context that you're operating in and if if you don't take steps to manage it it can be sort of you know death by a thousand cuts for a business and, and it can really like e each one of these things is, is small in terms of like time lost and uh and having to explain things and getting that context right but if you have to do it in every conversation uh then that time soon mounts up and as the complexities of the business and of the problems increase, then you spend more and more time doing it. And eventually, you know, you're in a you're in a meeting for an hour and you spend 20 minutes of it talking about what you're actually trying, like aligning in terms of terminology and making sure everyone's on the same page in terms of the purpose of the meeting before you even get into the meat uh, the meat of it. Yeah, I think we we even had a discussion with Lasso. It's, we were well, Lasso speaks multiple languages, but uh, Finnish is our native. So we were actually thinking, what is what is the Finnish world for distributed and decentralized? And we had a hard time finding those. So language has, um, a, that's of course when we cross the different language, but um, but by staying in, in a single language, as a as, as same word has different meanings. And that kind of um, can escalate into problems in an essence. But um, I mean, the common question that we get is about, you know, sharing the different data assets. And of course, this comes to, to the language question as well, that each one of the data assets talks within their domain with the language that they know the best. So, you know, how do you see that which domain should own and govern these data assets and how do you make them available across the domains? And is this, does this language issue become like a major thing when you start sharing between the domains? Yeah, it, 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 it definitely does. Um, I think I think the the easiest way to try and break it down is to try and think about data assets in terms of in terms of levels. So, going back to that divide between sort of operational and analytical. So let's say that level level one data assets are uh, are data that exists as part of operational systems. So they they have certain characteristics. They will their, their language will be very closely aligned to or hopefully closely aligned to the purpose they serve um, uh, within that system. Um, they will be orientated around the transactional nature of that system or, or likely orientated around the transactional nature of that system. Um, they will be very sort of like specifically focused on, on, a, uh, on a specific type of thing that is happening. Um, you then move up a level, the second level, you can think about that as almost like the first level of analytics. 
And at that point, there's, there's likely to be a few changes that have happened. So first of all, the orientation of the data is likely to be slightly different. Uh, perhaps it's been summarized, aggregated, or it's, it's presented in a different way. And that means the context of, uh, of that data has also likely changed. So you know, rather than a sale, you are potentially looking at sales. Uh, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a subtle change, but that language change is, is important because you're, you're no longer looking at a single thing, you're looking at multiples of things, perhaps in, in, uh, in some sort of new measure. Um, and again, that level two data has, has certain characteristics. As I said, you know, it's, it's potentially been summarized. It's maybe it's, uh, it's accessed as a, as a set of data rather than like an individual response through an API or something like that. Uh, presented more aligned to how people will actually use it and consume it within the organization. And then that final level, um, uh, in, in my view anyway, is uh, almost sort of like, you know, ready-made, ready-processed data that is, that, that is part of an existing model and can be combined with something. And there you've got a huge amount more context. So you have that, you have that original item, let's say it was the sale of something that was in that original source system. But it's been enriched at each different level and each different stage to take on to take on something else. So you know, perhaps it was summarized um, into sales at that second level, and then it is now part of a model where it's also been enriched with other with other data assets uh, around sort of you know uh, regions or you know the, the type of sales or the speed of sales or speed of conversion, you know, whatever whatever it is that you're looking at, and. While you're you're ultimately looking at a view um, on that that original data point, because you're two levels removed from where it was created, the context that you're looking at it is also has also changed dramatically, and you, you need a way of you need a way of tracking that for for a couple of different reasons. First of all, you know, people people need to be able to understand the complexities of working with data. If you have a uh, if you have a data point available in a Power BI model then all you need is access to that model and pretty much anyone who can write, uh, who can use an Excel um, sheet can create a visualization in Power BI. It's, it's really, really simple, very easy to do. If you have it at that level one raw data, then it needs to be mined. It needs to be, you know, the, the, there is a lot of a lot of steps in the process to getting it into that, into that point where, you, where it can be you know, used and visualized by someone with perhaps less technical skills. So, understanding the context of of the data both in terms of the language what it represents and also its its accessibility what what part of the organization what level of the organization uh, organization sits at is is very important because it not only tells people what it is but how they can or should be using it um, and that then comes back to, to ownership as well you know who, who owns the different levels and that brings us back to data mesh, which is you know right now maybe maybe the maybe the owning team for level one would be the, the product team, and then you'd have a, you know a, a data management or a BI team owning level two two and three perhaps. Um, as you as you move those things closer towards the owning team, those different levels should become more accurate, and the team that uh, that's defining those different levels and the data the context of the data at those different levels should have a better ability to accurately describe what they are, what they represent, and how they should be used. It's the the whole topic of language is I mean it it's super interesting. Um we we often come across this thing of like cultural barriers for becoming data driven and so on. And and language is, is culture. I mean language is an essential part of culture. So just based on this, I mean it will be when we do sort of assess um, organizational analytic or data maturity, you know, if you ask five people, what is the definition of customer from a data perspective, and if they all have sort of roughly the same understanding, then you, you probably have high maturity. But if they all have five different answers, then you know that, okay, there's, there's a bit of evolution that needs to happen here in terms of literacy and, and understanding of this. I think another based on this conversation, another indicator of maturity would probably be the um, how often the word governance uh, is used. So the the less it is used, probably the higher the maturity, I would yeah. actually argue based on this. That's, that's, that's a good point. Um, I mean, if you're, if, if, if you take those two measures together, 
know, if, if, if you have people that are that are aligned without a specific process that is designed to align them, then they are whether they whether whether it's intentional or not, they are mature. They they, they are operating in a way that is mature. So that's that's a really good way of looking at it, actually. I like that. So we were we're kind of already approaching the the topic of of data catalogs, and that was actually Steve one of the the original topics that brought us together. We we started having these conversations around data catalogs because that's one of the the areas that we both work with. And in this concept of a distributed system and, and data mesh or organic data management, whatever you want to call it, um, catalogs are an essential part of that. Um, what's your view of, of data catalogs? What is their role in, say, in your organization or in an ideal state? Um, well, first of all, I, you know, I really appreciate your efforts to launch organic data management as a, <laughs> a term in the industry. You know, it's, 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 it's good. ODM. It's good. You went in marketing, but you're doing a good job of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that one of the things that Data Mesh talks about is building data architecture um, and building something that is um, uh, a, a, a platform for a business to to use that is focused on on data. It's a little bit woolly about its definition. You know, I, I, I'm not clear from from the ThoughtWorks article whether data architecture is intended to be, you know, one thing or one set of technologies or multiple technologies that that are all working towards the same purpose and, and are accessed in different ways. But I I agree with that that principle of having um, having a set of technology within a business that is designed around the needs for data management of um, uh, of data for the business, not necessarily for for the products and for the operational functions, but for for the business in general. And I think a key part of that data architecture has to be some form of of data catalog or 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 sort of software or approach that is able to give you a contextual understanding of of the data that you're talking uh, that, that you're looking at um i if if i'm honest i think it's probably the most important thing um because you, let's let's say you know you start you start today and you build you, you build a, a new data warehouse and you've got really really good um um level of maturity and understanding around the um uh, around the terms you're using and everyone understands what a customer is. Everyone understands um, the, the, the various different data points. Maybe maybe you're a small company and a small team. Um, that's great, but it only lasts so long as that group of people are working together. And as soon as people start you know, leaving the company, going to different jobs, taking different roles, taking different responsibilities, and you get new people in to replace them, then that gets that, that understanding gets watered down. And uh, data catalog that's been well implemented is the only thing that can stop that knowledge leakage um, from within within a company uh, with regards to data. Um, and I think, again, that's another one of those, another one of those small things that, that doesn't really, it doesn't really seem like a big problem because on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's not, you know, if, 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 if there's no, if the person who created something is no longer around, there will likely be someone else who is able to explain what it is. And if there, if there isn't, then there's likely to be an approach where you can generate that understanding. You, know, you could look at, look at how it's used within the application, look at the code, look at what it does to get that understanding of, of, of what it represents. But it, while it's a solvable problem and not a particularly difficult problem, it's time and it's effort. And it's, it's a barrier to you getting at the data and, and, and sort of, answering the question that you that you were trying to answer and you scale that up to lots of different um, data questions which needs data answers and over time it becomes a big sort of time drain like a you know, like a vampire sort of like sucking sucking away at your efficiency um, so yeah a, a data catalog in my view is sort of central to uh, to trying to mitigate that yeah I think like one one of the sort of what we discussed earlier is that what 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 parts needs to be centralized and what needs to be distributed, and I think uh, of course when you have a distributed data system or data management, there has to be a central way to discover it. So, I I mean I, 
I feel that this is one of the things that needs to be centralized, of course. Otherwise, if you distribute it out, there's multiple ways to discover the data and, and um, it becomes quite a hassle. So there has to be one single place where you can discover the different data assets. Yeah, but then, who's, again, who's, while the software should, be, should definitely be single, uh, a single piece of software solving that problem, who's responsible for the maintenance of that? Is mm. there a centralized team that is that's running and managing the data catalog? Do you have like a, you know a master a master data management setup where every every change needs to be reviewed and approved by by a board and by a commission, or do you have something that is more focused on the on the teams that actually own it and everyone is is working in in the same way they they're, they're putting their information in the same place, but ultimately the responsibility for keeping it up to date is distributed across the business, and and both both come with positives and negatives. It's a, it's an interesting, again, takes us back to this topic of language. I think that the term, like this whole market of data catalogs, it's a poorly chosen word for a family of software. Um, the um, the reason I'm, I'm so intrigued by that market is because it is one of the few uh, platforms that bring together the whole data community from consumers to producers and, you know, everyone in between. Um, I think just like the term data catalog is a is a very limited or poor term to describe what they do. But yeah, to me, the interesting thing is it's like data is what brings the people together. But actually what they find is that, hey, there are other people here in this community too. And there are very few other platforms that have this reach that data catalogs have. But I, I it's a good point about how do you, again, distribute the responsibilities around the, the catalog while still maintaining some sort of central consistency and rules and ways of working. I was almost going to say governance, but I avoided it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, and I think uh, the, the question of what is a data catalog and, and what is what is the purpose of it as well, like that's, that's a tough one because it's... It, it's not one thing to one to one person, right? So to to a data analyst, it is a magic so piece of software that can answer your questions, and you can use it as Google for data within the organization. And in a perfect world, it makes your life dramatically easier and uh, solves many of your problems. For a team who owns operational data, you know, it it is a way of potentially maintaining continuity. So. As people uh, as people come and go from that team, and as as they leave, it's a way of of maintaining that same context and, and making sure everyone has that same understanding from an operational perspective. Um, other parts of the business, it's it's a way of um, centralizing data management. So you know, it could be an approach to or, or part of an approach to managing personal data. It could be um, part of um, part of an approach to um, tracking. Sort of data recoverability and um, uh, and availability from a, an operational perspective across the business, and each of these things could be a data catalog, but the, their implementation, their uses, is, is different from one person to the next. And I and I think the for me the the danger we, we we've been using a data catalog um, uh, called Elation for. Uh, about a year now, um, and for me, the danger of this is that we lose we lose focus of what we're trying to do with it, and and we try and almost do too much, and and I think the the difficult balance for us to get right with this piece of uh, software will be, you know, not necessarily limiting the amount of data that we that we put in, but making sure that the the data that is in there. Is relevant to what people are going to be looking for because because ultimately you know like anything it has inputs and it has outputs and the outputs are people searching for data so for it to be successful in that they have to be able to to find it and they have they have to be able to accurately and quickly not just not just sort of locate a data point but understand its context understand how it fits in within domains how it fits within um, uh, within sort of like specific applications uh, who's responsible for it, how it can be used. Um, and that becomes more challenging with the more data that you add in. Uh, scale problem, again. Yeah. It's something you, I mean, you, you use these comparisons or analogs to things like Google and 
a few others and we use this quite a lot in, in our data catalog projects because again it's not people don't really know what to associate it to or sort of compare it to so you know we talk about the google or the wiki or the trip advisor um, or the like the community board just actually this morning we were developing some hypotheses around data catalog and i think we're developing one around um especially on the topic of lineage and tracing where the data comes from um you know comparing it to these dna tests that you can do so just like just to have a way of, of talking about what these catalogs are without using again this boring term of data catalog which doesn't really mean that much to people so yeah it's it's an interesting topic and interesting software place as well because there's a lot of um, development happening there so what i what i kind of hear you saying steve is that instead of having like you can have too much in a data catalog to make it sort of you lose the track of maybe quality and and the most important information and so on so if i'd sort of conclude what you're saying is that have more relevant information there rather than everything yeah 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 F find the balance and and for us um how we have been viewing it is it's a sort of um uh it, it will grow with us as we as we mature so you know, as we as we get a better understanding of where where our value lies, mm -hmm. we can focus the data catalog in those areas of value and, and and on that specific value, and perhaps remove remove or sort of hide things that uh, or, or or make them less less visible um, for for things that don't necessarily have an immediate value. Like they they're potentially still discoverable. They're still they're still accessible for some form of value that we haven't considered which is always always important um but ideally as we as we mature with the data catalog uh we will start to coalesce around sort of a, a subset of of data stores and repositories which store the the majority of the the valuable data within within the organization uh, and then as as and when more value is uncovered um, perhaps it forms part of those repositories. Perhaps we add, we add new repositories. But it's kind of a, you know, you got to start somewhere. And if your starting point is that you can't be sure of where that value is, then you almost have to start with everything and then whittle it down as as time goes on. All right. So so we covered a lot of topics here. We talked about language culture. We've talked about data products, the like different layers of operational to analytics. Um, we talked about data catalogs we talked about that um the word that we don't use anymore the one that begins with a g um but like, here's a here's a sort of big hypothetical question for you if if you were the master architect of your own company and the whole enterprise and, and you got the task of redesigning it from scratch completely um i guess you know you don't need to go into what it would look like but what are some of the key principles that you would maybe apply or try to do differently from the way things are today this is the uh the sort of the thanos click my fingers and things are the way, the way that i want them right yeah the architect from from matrix or something like that <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i think the, fir the first thing to say is in in reality i if i if i or anyone else tried to define a business around its data um, from the ground up, I don't think that would be a sensible approach to starting a business. First of all, and I, I don't think it would it would be able that that business would be able to to sort of you know make it past its infancy, um, pure, purely because and, and while it's while it causes problems down the line, I think for a new organisation for, um, for 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 like a startup, for example. They have bigger things and bigger problems to worry about. Then are they are they managing their their data well, uh, and are they uh, are they sort of like uh, thinking ahead about how it's going to be used in the future? Um, and I, I think like you know that that isn't it, it, it certainly causes problems. And and once a uh, once a business reaches a certain size, then those those decisions and that that lack of attention will you know bite it in the ass for want of a better term. Um, but I think that's a necessary evil. You can't you can't get away from that, and it's almost like a, a good problem to have because it means that you haven't gone out of business in those first two or three years. Um, however, back back to your question. 
So, um, so with my with my matrix hat or my my sort of matrix architect suit on, um, where I'm able to uh, to magically create a business uh, that's designed around how I want the data to be structured. I think the most important thing would be strong uh, domain boundaries and domain definitions from the start. Um, it is uh, much easier to start with a list of domains and understanding uh, understand how data fits into that domain. Uh, or, or new data fits into that domain and where uh, where there isn't a good fit and a new domain should be created to house that, then it is to try and retrospectively apply that to, uh, to a business. Because domains, again, mean different things to different people and different uh, there are different viewpoints on how and where they should be created and structured. So, for example, from a data perspective, um, I really just want nice, nice, neat boxes that I can use to to group things from an organizational perspective. You know, is this? Are we talking about a customer? Are we talking about a product? Are we talking about an operational function? Um, from a business ops perspective, it's probably orientated around value generation. You know, how how do we how do we understand the value that, that exists within this domain and the creation of that? So I think to to, to click my fingers and, and sort of change change something would be uh, would be to the the implementation implementation of strong domains and I also wonder what sort of maturity uh, or, or what what a mature business that had strong domains from the very offset or from the very start look like or what 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 would be different about it if they if they had that that thing that you know every business goes through at some point on its growth cycle uh, where you have to sort of start dividing things up in, in two domains in order to organize them and manage them. If that was from the start, would the business be in a better place? Would it, would it be able to do things that it wasn't currently able to do? Would we have a lot more organizations that are uh, creating AI and uh, machine learning uh, applications because they, they, they have much greater access to, to their own data? And awesome. I think on the if we if we look from the development side of things, typically what I hear quite often is that you know start with the monolith because you might not know how to break it into domains. And once you once you sort of get a grasp of this, this actually makes sense to break it apart. Then move into more decentralized or distributed approach. So I guess a similar idea would be could be applied to the to the world of data. Yeah, and and that's actually a, a, a good point on just distributed systems in general, whether you're talking about microservices or data mesh, because, you know, if you, if you have a monolith, complexity is relatively easy to, to add in, right? You know, if you, if you want to, if you think you have a certain type of data problem that you need to solve, it's relatively easy to build that into to a monolith. If you are building a distributed system, uh, and you're you're sort of adding new features and functionality that you think may be required. That is slightly more, it's a, a chunk more complex to to implement. You you need a whole different set of services. You need a whole different sort of like set of teams to own them potentially. So, understanding that sort of like that minimum value, like in keeping a laser focus on the thing that you're trying to build and the thing that you're trying to deliver, and not letting um, sort of scope creep or, or sort of like, you know, oh, it'd be cool if we could do that uh, and sort of you know, build, build these things because otherwise you you sort of, you can end up with a distributed system that's far larger and more complex than it needs to be. And keeping keeping that view on the original, the original problem and not letting yourself get distracted by all of the things that you could and potentially even should do, that's, that's the difficult thing with distributed systems it's hard, hard to keep that focus and and if i was to if i heard it correctly and if i was to summarize where you started that from a, what you're saying is business first and data second and then the the other aspect was to think carefully be carefully and focus on the domains so so yeah even though we're we're data geeks but business comes first and that's the the only right way to do it um well steve we've we've kept you for a while and obviously knowing our history we can we could keep on talking forever, but um, I think we're going to move into the, the wrap-up questions, um, which should become standard as well in our series of interviews. So, so um, just to wrap things up, um, based on this conversation, is there a question that you think um, we should ask or that you want us to ask from the next guest that we'll have in this interview series? Yeah, um, 
uh, I had to think about this a little bit, but I, I think a really interesting question would be um, what concepts or approaches or technologies that exist in the software engineering world would you like to see applied to data engineering? Um, and you know that that's a big part of the shift in the last few years. You know, as, as data has become more uh, more engineering focused, a lot of a lot of those concepts have ported across from application software development into uh, into data engineering, and it's great. Like, is that there are some things that don't fit quite as well as as they as, as they do in the uh, the application world and the software world, but for the most part, it, it's really increased the quality. So I'd be really interested to hear what other people, where people think that that could be improved further or, or what, what could happen with it going forward into the future. Yeah, I, I really like that question because I, I think like the data mess is kind of mixing the, the world of software development to the data. So what's the next trend? <laughs> I guess we're, we're after that. That's really yeah. cool. Cool. We're also going to speak with some of our technology partners. So is there um, anything you think we should be asking them, um, not naming? Well, you can name them if you want to, but is there a question that we should ask our technology partners on this topic? I mean, it might be a fairly obvious, an obvious one, because ultimately their, their success in answering this question would drive their own revenue. But I mean, my, my first question would be that the scale and complexity of data that exists within organizations is only going one way. It's only, it's only increasing. Um, so what, what tools and what, what sort of objectives do they have on their roadmap to help organizations spend less time managing that data and more time actually using it? Um, because you know, right, right now, it is hard to get data management right. And it is, it is hard to, to look at a whole organization at a high level and go, yes, they are efficient with data. It, it's, it's hard to even sort of like put together the metrics of how you would, you would assess that. Like I'm sure you guys have done your fair share of data maturity assessments. And um, in my experience, while they're, while they're valuable in their own right, they never quite fit and they never feel like they quite get to the nub of the problem because every organization is is different in terms of how it deals with data and treats treats data. So yeah, my, my question to sort of the, uh, the these software companies and platforms is how, how are you going to help with that? How, how, how do we how do we continue to increase the amount and complexity of data without drowning in it? Awesome. Excellent. We'll, we'll take that forward too. And then the third thing we want to ask you is, um, do you have any, any tips, advice, uh, reading tips or anything else you want to leave with our hundreds and thousands of listeners and viewers? <laughs> um, so it's not related to, to data, um, but a podcast that I've been listening to a lot recently is called Land of the Giants. Um, and it follows the evolution of uh, tech giants like Amazon, Netflix, and, and Google. Um, I find it really interesting because it's, it's a very balanced uh, podcast, a very balanced view on these companies. And obviously, we all know these companies. We, we all know how we use them and our own personal interactions with them. Um, but it tracks the, the evolution um, and sort of like how, how they started from an idea and became the monolithic organizations that they are now um and it, it it forces me to ask quite sort of interesting questions about what i'm doing and, and the actions that i'm taking right now and how how they could impact things down the line you know this implementation of a uh, of a data catalog for example like where where will that lead us what, what will that allow us to do is it is it potentially one of those things that we look back on and go oh i wish wish we did that differently um, and to, to, and seeing sort of like these these huge companies that have unquestionably experienced massive success and done done more right than they've done wrong from a, a, an evolution perspective anyway, um, but getting a bit of a deep dive into things that have gone wrong and things that aren't right, both sort of from a technology perspective or a cultural perspective, that's uh, that's really interesting. Uh, and I'm currently working my way through. I'm just looking up at it now, actually. Um, uh, a data practitioner's guide to graph data. So it's an O'Reilly book. Um, and, and again, like, you know, it, it's quite easy to understand at a high level concepts around graph data and, and why you might use it. 
taking a bit of a, a bit of a deep dive um, for me is helping me change how I think about where value sits in data and the orientation of of that value and, and, and the application of it. So that's that, I'm, I'm quite enjoying that at the moment. Um, despite not being allowed to leave the house, really, I still am struggling to find time to read it. But uh, that's a, another topic. <laughs> that's awesome. really good. We'll have yeah. those links in the uh, in the below. All right. Um, yeah, and it's a good point about the the podcast you mentioned and sort of understanding the impact uh, or influence of what we're doing, thinking beyond the immediate um, impact, but actually sort of doing scenario planning and, and understanding the broader impact of the work that we're doing, whether it is AI based or or not, um, anything that has to do with data. It's a really interesting aspect. Cool. Well, Steve, it's been a pleasure to have you on the first episode of, of our uh, interview series. And um, I'm sure we'll speak again soon, but we'll wrap it up for today. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you soon again. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Pleasure to be here. Really enjoyed it. So that was our chat with Steve. Wow, so many insightful points. And Steve always knows how to express things so well. Um, Antti, what did you take away from this chat? Well, I found the point about not putting everything into a data catalog it, very interesting. It is a similar message that I hear from a lot of data catalog vendors. So, you know, even though you have multiple data sources, uh, don't overload the data catalog with, with, with all of the data, with all of the raw data but get more into this um, curated data or, or into information. So it's kind of, we're, we're, at the, we're at the stage where we are high on data, but low on information. Um, and I feel that this is a kind of reflection to that. So I think we are a bit of passing the big data phase and we're getting into really using information in the companies. Yeah, and Steve talked about this concept of a data product. It's an easy word to say, but it's actually very difficult to define what a data product is. Um, and the other thing, the thing with Steve is that we can continue talking forever. And in fact, um, after we stopped recording the conversation, we still stayed on for an additional 30 or 45 minutes uh, talking about the same thing. So we could just go on forever. Um, for me personally as a somewhat an outside observer because i'm not a, a technical engineer or anything like that this whole deliberation of like the software development approach versus the data management approach it's still hugely fascinating and steve has some good points on what data management can learn from software development um, it's always a very practical and tangible conversation with steve yeah this was a great session and we have some really exciting guests coming up uh, make sure to subscribe to this podcast or YouTube channel, uh, depending on your preference. Like, share with your friends and colleagues and give us a five star rating. All feedback is always very, very welcome. The next episode will be posted in a week or so. And we will we look forward for having slice of data with you. Thanks again, Steve. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time. Take care. Bye.